Hello and welcome, I'm Tarek Basley and this is Downstream, the week's top stories from the world of science and technology on Al Jazeera. This week, a new sighting of Britain's long lost Martian probe, the super spud that could feed the world, Microsoft's new Windows 10 operating system and we meet the doctors in China behind a new stem cell procedure that could help paralysed patients. But first, this week we've seen the fallout online from the deadly attacks on the Paris magazine office of Charlie Hebdo. Tens of thousands of websites in France were attacked and defaced, mainly from computers in North Africa. The government's official response, a promise that it will tackle terrorism not only on the streets, but also on the internet. Here's Nick Spicer in Paris. The attacks against the magazine Charlie Hebdo and a Jewish supermarket set off another kind of attack, a much wider cyber assault on targets in France. Hackers reportedly based in part in North Africa changed the home pages of thousands of websites of universities, town councils and local shops, among others. France's interior minister on Monday toured a cybercrime unit of the French police outside Paris. He said he would present measures to fight the hackers this week. Plus de Teams of hackers claiming to be allied with Islamist organizations claimed responsibility for the attacks. They seized the opportunity to show their ability to do harm. Late last year, the French government passed a new anti-terror law. It bans French websites from recruiting fighters who want to join organizations the French government considers to be terrorist. And it also bans sites from condoning the type of attacks France has just gone through but it's hard to see what kind of new measures could prevent determined hackers operating from overseas. As the French struggle to return to a feeling of being safe, the hacked websites feel like an attempt to say, no, you're not. The attacks were not sophisticated, but they were massive. Experts call the replaced home pages defacements. A defacement is like if you are in a town with many different shops and the hackers, what they try to do, they try to enter every shop. And if the door is not really well closed, they enter the shop, you know, they, they, they paint some messages on the window and they leave. And after, you have to enter the, the shop and to clean the mess. It's a mess that individual website owners will have to clean up, often by simply updating their website software. But wiping the feeling of unease away won't be as easy. Well, this week, new evidence emerged relating to one of the great deep space mysteries of recent years. What happened to Britain's Beagle 2 spacecraft, lost in space for 12 years after it fell silent while attempting to land on Mars? Now it's been spotted on the red planet and is largely intact. Andrew Potter went to the announcement in London. For Britain, it was a groundbreaking mission, sending a spacecraft to land on Mars and at $75 million at a fraction of the cost of most space exploration. But after Beagle 2 was released into the Martian atmosphere on Christmas Day 2003, it was never seen or heard from again. Until now. What we can say today with some confidence is that Beagle 2 is no longer lost. It had been feared Beagle 2 had crashed into the surface of Mars or bounced off the atmosphere into space. Recent photographs from an American spacecraft orbiting Mars have turned that thinking on its head. This is what they think is Beagle 2, sitting near its intended landing spot. What is consistent with those images is that the Beagle 2 didn't fully deploy. It had four solar panels, all of which needed to deploy in order to uncover the antenna, which would transmit data back to orbiting satellites and back to the Earth. And then we needed that antenna to command Beagle 2. What's extremely frustrating about it is we got so close. This was Britain's first attempt at getting a spacecraft to another planet, and rather than being seen as a failure, scientists hope the legacy of Beagle will be to unlock the secrets of Mars. There's an additional frustration I hadn't thought about. It's Beagle 2 collected some scientific data. It may still be on Beagle 2, and we can never get to it. Colin Pillinger was the enthusiastic face of the mission. Close contact with the spacecraft. I, we're not that far away from it in the orbit. He died last year, but his daughter was there to hear the news that her father's life's work wasn't lost in space. He'd be saying, so when are we going again? When's the next mission? You know, how are we going to do things differently? 
The scientists think there's every chance Beagle 2 would still work, if only there was a way to open its solar panels. The European Space Agency plans to land a probe on Mars next year, taking in the lessons of what was once called a heroic failure. Well, it is a remarkable find and one that's taken years of effort. Keith Smith from the Royal Astronomical Society explains how they did it. They found the uh, Beagle 2 by uh, very carefully looking at some of the high-resolution images that's coming from a, an orbiter that's currently going around Mars, uh, NASA's um, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And they used uh, what is the, the best camera we have in the Mars system at the moment and poured over many thousands of images searching for the tiny speck that is Beagle 2. And after 11 years of trying, they found it. We've now discovered just how close it came to, to being a very successful mission. It was very, very close. It got down to the surface. It was in the middle of unfurling itself. And then for some reason, which we don't yet know, it didn't quite manage to contact Earth. But everything else seems to have worked. Unfortunately, the, the part that hasn't unfurled is the part that covers the radio antenna. So uh, even now we know where it is, we won't be able to interrogate it. Maybe once we get better imaging of it, we might be able to see a bit more what the condition of the lander is and maybe what went wrong there. Maybe when we eventually do send people to Mars, we might be able to pick it up and have a look at it. Um, but at the moment, we're going to have to be analysing some fuzzy blobs in images for a bit yet. Well, from outer space to that vital element for life on Earth, water. We take a look at the cost of desalination here in Qatar and the machine that makes water from air. Shows you that we're condensing. Plus tighter rules online for China's 700 million internet users. Now, though, some of the other technology stories of the week. Farming genetically modified crops could be set to increase in Europe. The European Union's voted in favour of a new law which gives member states the freedom to decide for themselves whether GM crops are grown within their borders. Genetically modified crops are widely grown in the US and Asia, but have been a divisive issue in Europe. And Google says it stopped sales of its glass eyewear. Reports of the move say it's to create room for a new version of the product. The smart glasses let users take photos, videos, and even get directions on a small screen on their right eye. But the technology hasn't been without controversy. Some argue it violates privacy, which has then led some bars and restaurants to ban the device. Well, there's been a false alarm on board the International Space Station. Astronauts were evacuated from the US side of the space station and moved to the Russian section when a computer malfunctioned and set off an alarm, at first thought to be an ammonia leak on board. Well, this week, China looked to tighten its cyber security rules. Internet users are being told they must now register with their real identities when using media apps and online forums. Here's Florence Louis in Beijing. There are 700 million internet users in China. That's half this country's population. And China's internet regulator announces it wants to know the real identities of people commenting on online forums, social media websites. It says people can still use their nicknames, but only after they've registered with website administrators. China's Cyberspace Administration hasn't said how it intends to police and enforce this regulation, however, and it has proved difficult to enforce in the past. For example, only 80% of users of WeChat, that's China's most popular instant messaging service, have registered their real identities, even though they were told to do so last year. And in Beijing, users of social media platforms are also required to register their real names. But service providers have admitted that they find it difficult to force people to do so because it's a time-consuming effort. Well, China's internet regulator says this measure is to ensure that they can regulate online content and to make sure that there's no spread of rumors on the internet. Chinese internet users, however, are not so sure, with some expressing concerns about whether this move will lead to even more self-censorship and whether or not service providers can actually guarantee the safety and security of their personal information. It only happens once every few years and is met with a mixture of criticism, consternation and outright indifference. I'm talking about a new operating system from computer giant Microsoft. And this week's launch of Windows 10 is no different. 
In the desktop world, Microsoft remains dominant. Over 90% of the world's desktops running Windows operating systems. Remarkably, one in five of these, 18% of all desktops, run Windows XP, even though it's now 14 years old and no longer officially supported by Microsoft. Compare that to Apple OS X. It runs on less than 4% of desktops. According to Microsoft, Windows 10 will work across a wide range of devices, including desktop PCs, Microsoft Surface tablet, and on Windows smartphones. At the same time, Microsoft will be hoping the new system wins over the all-important business market. Well, until now, Microsoft has had subtly different operating systems on its phones, on its tablets, on its desktops, and so on. And as a result, it hasn't been able to use its dominance on the desktop to push into mobile. And in fact, quite the opposite, it's been holding it back. So they want Windows 10 to unify everything. So as you said, you can have the same experience, you can run what looks like the same software, you can buy stuff from the same software store or app store. And so people will want to use the mobile because they're using the desktop, or they want to use the desktop because they're using the mobile. Well, the potato is the world's third most important crop after wheat and rice. But almost 250 million farmers worldwide live on land with high salt levels, which isn't suitable for growing potatoes. That is, until now. I've just come back from a visit to the Dutch island of Tessel, where a team of researchers has been developing a potato they say could change the world. They're being sorted and packed for sale to some of the Netherlands' top restaurants, but these are no ordinary potatoes. Their exceptional properties, their developers say, could change the lives of millions of farmers worldwide. It has a high salt tolerance, so high that we can grow it with half seawater under Dutch conditions. And uh, the specialty about this potato is that it tastes much nicer than an ordinary potato because there are a lot of aromas in it. It's sweeter. Until researchers here started looking into it, it was widely believed you couldn't grow potatoes in soil with a salt reading of over eight. But as you can see, if you choose the right variety, the amount of potatoes you grow may drop, but it's still a decent quantity. These ones were irrigated with a 50-50 mix of fresh and sea water. It's estimated more than 250 million farmers around the world live on salt-affected soils like these in the Netherlands. Their choice of crop and their yields have largely been limited by the salt levels in the soil. Everybody thinks uh, salt water in agriculture is not a good combination, but we are proving here that you can do a lot with the brackish water resources of the world and you can use saline soils to produce a lot of food. And it's not just potatoes. They're exploring salt resistance in dozens of other crops, including carrots and cabbages, tomatoes and strawberries. And they're looking at whether some of these could be grown on floating mats in salty water. Many of their results fly in the face of guidance given to farmers by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Everybody's using the data of the FAO as an international standard, but we found varieties of many different crops who grow much better under a saline condition than everybody thinks is possible. Salt Farm Tessel currently have a test crop of their new potato growing in Pakistan, where an estimated three million hectares are affected by salt. They grow an average of uh, six to seven tons per hectare, and this potato hopefully will produce next year 12 to 20 tons per hectare, and then it's of course uh, an enormous jump ahead. Results from the tests are expected next month. A positive outcome could well see this new potato assume a starring role in helping to feed the world. Well, we'll be following that test crop, expected to be harvested at the end of January, and bring you the results when it is. At the heart of that story, the global demand for fresh water, and a summit which has been held this week in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Our environment editor, Nick Clark, has been at the meeting and looking at some of the issues and technologies being discussed. This summit is being held in a region with one of the highest water consumption rates in the world, and yet water supply here is on a knife edge. Take the Gulf state of Qatar, for example, where they say that there's only enough emergency water supplies to last two days. You wouldn't think water was in short supply, given the amount that's used to make things grow where nothing should. Here's the primary source, the Arabian Gulf, 
vast quantities of seawater are sucked in every day by energy intensive, environmentally destructive desalination plants. The fact that this is just about as close as you can get to a desalination plant without a huge amount of bureaucracy and identity processing speaks volumes for just how crucial these installations are to this region. Without them, there would be no drinking water, the taps would just run dry, and life in the Gulf just could not exist in the way that it does. In this parched, arid land, you don't expect this, a business selling four million cut flowers a year, grown not abroad, but in chilled glasshouses in Qatar. A borehole supplies the water. The problem is the ancient aquifer it comes from is nearly depleted, thanks to over-extraction across the country. Growth in population is uh, expected at, um, at a high rate for the upcoming years, especially with the um, uh, major events that we would uh, uh, host here in uh, the upcoming years. So this can be a big problem if we uh, don't use the, uh, the available water in a reasonable way. Now they're piloting a soil-free hydroponic project which recycles water with impressive results. The idea is to encourage the region's farmers to adopt similar systems. Believe it or not, this is another source of water, raw sewage. It comes from a workers' camp outside Doha, where all wastewater is recycled, utilizing specially designed tape. It's a perfect home for bacteria. On here, if you looked at it under a microscope, you'd see millions and millions of micro perforations. So essentially this is giving what happens in nature a perfect uh, environment to do in our, in our concrete tanks or in our uh, containers, our 40 foot containers. The process ends with clear water that runs into an adjacent farm, giving life to new growth. On the larger scale, more and more sewage treatment plants are being built in Qatar, recycling water that can be used for irrigation. But there's a long way to go. These trucks are dumping raw sewage into holding lakes in the desert, where it lies untreated, a potential water supply evaporating into the hot desert air. The remarkable thing is, nature takes its course, and the wastewater becomes clean enough for a flock of flamingos to take up residence. The Global Economic Forum rates water scarcity as the number one risk when it comes to global insecurity. But therein lies an opportunity, and that's what this summit is all about. It's all about innovation and sharing ideas. This is the innovation center of all the exhibits here. They're talking about uh, soil quality, improving soil quality to improve its water retention. And here is new technology for desalination plants that will reduce their carbon footprint. And here's technology that quite literally takes water out of the air that we breathe. In this case, 500 liters a day. And here's a small water drinking unit, which explains how it works. So what's the form? Well, this is for your home or office. This unit, for instance, has a couple of bars of water, which is what we started with today. People have been drinking it all day long. It's at the same level because it's actually making water while we're talking. This shows you that we're condensing. This is pure water from the air. No heavy metals, no fluoride, no chlorine. Tastes. And of course, this system is scalable. This it's system, pretty good, so you can scale it up. Yeah. This system makes 12 to 15 liters a day. Yes, that makes 500 liters. With this technology, we go up to about 18,000 liters a day. But I have new patented technology just done about two weeks ago where we're going to scale up to actually millions of gallons a day with a new kind of technology. So one day it could replace desalination plants? Well, I think we can complement desalinization plants. We're looking at about the same price per cubic meter, about $2 per cubic meter. And at that price, with no environmental impact, I think it is a good solution for many, many companies. All right, thanks very much. So there you go. It's not just about taking uh, water out of the air, though. There's also projects here that talk about taking water out of oil and gas. Desalination plants may be here to stay for the time being, but the future could look very different. And finally this week, Chinese doctors say they've performed a world first in surgery using stem cells to treat a paralysed patient. They've been inserting the cells in a way they hope will regenerate and heal the spine. Kim Vanell has the details. While all operations are delicate, there's an added level of pressure when the surgery is a world first. On the table is a patient known only as Mr Wang. Paralyzed in a car accident two months ago, it's hoped this experimental procedure will one day allow him to walk again. 
Neurosurgeons are placing one of these small tubes, called stents, in Mr Wang's spine. But it's what comes next that's pushing the boundaries of medicine. From the first surgery, a scar formed and took up the entire damaged part of the spine. We cut it off entirely, then replaced it with a stent and planted stem cells on it to grow. These so-called stem cells, it's hoped, will regenerate and, in a way, heal the spine. They've been testing it on animals for the past 10 years with some success. Spinal nerves are a bunch of nerves like what we see in a cable. So we've designed orderly collagenous fibers like a bridge or a rail through which nerves can crawl over. Stem cells can produce tissue regenerative elements so they can improve the regeneration capacity. The stem cell market is a multi-billion dollar industry and this surgery has yet to be scrutinized by the international medical community. Clinics in the parts of Asia where stem cell therapy is legal are eager to promote their procedures, which watchdogs say are often expensive and probably ineffective. Surgeons in China will be hoping to replicate the success seen in Poland last year. There, a man paralyzed in a knife attack was able to walk again after cells from his nose were transplanted into his spine. The surgery was different because of the types of cells used and the way they were implanted. For Mr Wang, recovery, if it happens, will be slow. Every development watched closely by those hoping for the same kind of cure. Well, that's all I have for you this week. If you've enjoyed the show, I hope you'll share it and have a look at the Al Jazeera website, aljazeera.com. You can also follow me, Tarek Basley, on Twitter, at Tarek Basley. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye.